All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are locked on Falcons. I am your host, Aaron Freeman. And today we're talking about what to make of Grady Jarrett skipping voluntary workouts, the signing of Vincent Taylor and what impact he could bring for the Falcons defense. And we'll take a deeper look and whether or not Garrett Wilson, the Ohio State wide receiver, is all that he's cracked up to be. Are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So, guys, you know me. I'm Aaron Freeman. Been covering the Falcons for many years. Formerly at Falcfans.com. RIP. Still going strong on Twitter at Falcfans, and of course the host of this world-renowned Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, right here on the Locked On Podcast Network, as well as the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family. And today's episode of Locked On Falcons is brought to you by Blue Nile. This Mother's Day, give mom something special that she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry at BlueNile.com. And Locked On Sports listeners get $50 off $500. Use code Locked On at checkout. So, guys, I want to thank everyone that makes Locked On Falcons their first listen. And, of course, Locked On Falcons is free and available on the same podcast platforms that you can find all the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcasts, which is Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, and, of course, on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to the Locked On Falcons YouTube channel, and you'll get the video version of the podcast the night before you get the audio version in the morning. So let's talk a little bit about today's news. The Falcons kicked off their voluntary phase one of OTAs. And probably the most notable thing was that Grady Jarrett was not there. Uh, now, I don't think this is a, a big deal. You know, it's something we'll keep an eye on as the rest of the offseason unfolds. Again, it is the voluntary, voluntary phase of uh, OTAs. It's phase one, which basically means all that the team is doing is weightlifting and, and watching film. Right. There's no real on field stuff until phase two. And then even then you're just going through like walkthroughs and whatnot. So even if Grady Jarrett doesn't show up for, you know, the next five weeks, I think is what phase ones and phase two uh, last until the end of May. You know, not really a whole lot that he's missing other than, you know, a couple of Zoom meetings. And we all know that ain't nobody enjoying Zoom meetings. So, um you know, really what we'll just sort of have to wait and see is when phase three kicks off and that kicks off in late May. I think May 24th is when that sort of starts for the Falcons. And then they'll have the mandatory mini camp that runs in mid June. And that's the point where you're kind of like, oh, like if he's missing this time, maybe that is significant because, you know, and I, I don't know this 100 percent certainty, but the last time I recall Grady Jarrett skipping OTAs and whatnot was the year that he was tagged in the franchise tag. And obviously, you know, players skip this, the voluntary stuff um, when they're, you know, negotiating a contract. And apparently as we've been hearing rumors and scuttlebutt over the last couple of months, you know, since Steve Weiss sort of put it out there in late February that the Falcons are trying to get Grady Jarrett signed to a contract extension. So uh, maybe that's the reason. Maybe he just simply is like, yeah, you know, I can do all this work, particularly in phase one, better uh on my own you know maybe he he found you know there were there was a special at Krispy Kreme or Dunkin Donuts and he he woke up a little bit late and he was like yeah hey, you know what I'll just eat these donuts and uh, you know whatever the reason is uh you know to to Grady Jarrett's own so I wouldn't panic about it we'll just sort of see how it develops and again this will be a much bigger story in late May or in, in early June if we're still saying oh Grady Jarrett's not there then that becomes a story but until then it's not really a big deal but of course it's of course not a big deal because of course the Falcons signed Vincent Taylor because he's going to fill that Grady Jarrett size hole. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but the Falcons officially announced the signing of Vincent Taylor on Tuesday. It was initially reported that he had agreed the terms on Saturday. And Taylor's an interesting player. He kind of fits that Fabian Moreau, Auden Tate mold of a player that I think, you know, you're sort of looking at. It's probably like a high-level backup, low-level starter. Uh, but, you know, considering the price tag that you're paying for him, presumably veteran minimum, that's pretty good bang for your buck because, 
You know, he's originally a, a six round pick out of Oklahoma State back in 2017 for the Dolphins. His first two seasons were he was a little nicked up, ended both of those seasons on injured reserve. But when he did get on the field as a back in rotational guy, was very productive, particularly against the run. I know Pro Football Focus and their run stop rate metric had him as the number two interior defensive lineman in the NFL in his rookie season and then number nine in 2018. So he was basically Snacks Harrison but on a much smaller sample size, right, in terms of his production against the run, not necessarily the same player as Snacks Harrison. But he's notable, noted for his strength. He also does give you a little bit of juice as a pass rusher, you know, on 198 pass rushing snaps over those two seasons in Miami. He had 18 pressures and two sacks. And you compare that to someone like Taquan Graham, who was the Falcons' next most uh, pro, not productive, but most used pass rusher this past year, who had 171 pass rush snaps and had zero sacks and six pressures. So on a similar workload, he was much, you know, three times as more productive as the Falcons' next best pass rusher after Grady Jarrett. And that sort of per snap pressure rate is comparable to what we saw with Grady Jarrett in 2019 and 2020. So it's not to sit here and say, oh, oh, Vincent Jackson, or I'm sorry, Vincent Taylor is just as good as Grady Jarrett or anything like that. But it is at least a decent bet that with an increased workload, you know, what could this player be? It's a low risk, medium type of reward in that regard. And so, you know, those first two years in, in Miami were very promising for him. Um, despite the injuries. And I think there were big expectations based off what I've read from Dolphin fans going in that 2019 season when they brought in Brian Flores and sort of what he could do with a more expanded role in that scheme. And then he was wind up being a cut at the end of that summer and a surprise cut based off what I've read from various Dolphin fans who were very intrigued and Dolphins media that were very intrigued about his potential and what he could do with an expanded role. Uh, and then he's kind of bounced around the league since then, was with Buffalo on their practice squad in 2019, uh, was briefly with the Browns uh, a year or two ago, and then was scooped up by the Texans this past year, um, and then wound up earning a starting spot, was a starter for them in week one uh, as one of their D tackles next to Malik Collins, and then got hurt in that week one game and was out for the rest of the season with, I think, an ankle injury. So he's dealt with knee injuries and ankle injuries and foot injuries, so that's something to keep an eye on. But it is one of those things, again, it's in that sort of Alden Tate, Fabian Moreau mold of you know low risk medium reward probably will wind up being a high-end backup necessarily than a, a a touted starter or something like that but again pretty good bang for your buck and so we'll see if he gets the opportunities that he flashed uh in miami with an expanded role and could be potentially a solid you know number two interior defensive lineman for the Falcons. I think when you look at, you know, him versus Taquan Graham versus Anthony Rush versus Marlon Davidson, you know, some of these interior guys that the Falcons have currently on the roster, you know, again, it's a limited workload, but Vincent Taylor has done more in a smaller, you know, brief uh, opportunities in, in, in his NFL career than some of these other guys that we're expecting, you know, to potentially carve out significant roles. So um, we'll see, you know, what he can wind up doing. And we'll get into a conversation about Garrett Wilson and what I think he'll wind up doing in the NFL. Uh, and I'm not as high on Garrett Wilson as others are. And I'll basically break that down as we continue uh, today's Locked on Falcons. But before we get there, guys, you know, Garrett Wilson is a popular projection for the Falcons in a mock draft. But you probably... And if you, you know, you won't, you will definitely know by the end of today's episode, was it my pick for the Falcons in the ultimate mock draft that the Lockdown Podcast Network is currently running. Uh, if you're checking this episode out on Wednesday, it's now day three of the six day extravaganza that began on Monday. If you missed the Falcons pick and who I had the Falcons selecting, not Garrett Wilson, uh, you can check that out on Tuesday's episode. But you want to listen to all these shows because it's going to be a great night on draft night next week and this ultimate mock draft is getting you geared up where experts like me gurus like me are up there giving our picks on who we think our respective teams here on the lockdown podcast network should be taking and then of course next week you're all ready to go with three days of live coverage here on the lockdown podcast network uh checking out the locked on nfl draft live show on youtube on facebook on whatever your streaming platform is beginning all on thursday april 28th and that of course is coming at you live uh next week and again in the meantime check out the ultimate mock draft on your preferred podcast platform apple odyssey google spotify and youtube and guys we know after the draft there's a big holiday that comes up and that's mother's day and you may be looking for that special gift for that special someone in your life 
and you may have difficulty finding the right one. I know I certainly do with these types of events. And the jewelry experts at BlueNile.com are making it easy for you. They're available 24-7 via phone, via chat, and they'll help you find the perfect gift to fit everyone's budget. Make this Mother's Day memorable and celebrate that special someone with something that's enduring like diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthday pendants, and so much more by checking out BlueNile.com. You can easily navigate through thousands of fine jewelry options at every price point. This Mother's Day, give mom something that she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners get $50 off $500. $500. This podcast exclusive is only good through Mother's Day. Use code locked on. That's code locked on. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging so that they won't give away what's inside. Shop stress free and find your forever peace by going to bluenile.com today. So, this conversation about Garrett Wilson is prompted by two emails that we got from listeners over the past week. Uh, about Garrett Wilson, you know, they sent in those emails and you you too can by heading over to locked on Falcons at mail.com. And the first one comes from Dan F and he says, I've been listening to the podcast for a little over a year now. Love the show was wondering what your thoughts were on the Falcons pulling a reverse Bengals draft Garrett Wilson this year and then CJ Stroud next year. While the Bengals obviously went Joe Burrow first and Jamar Chase next. And then Stephen B says, not saying Garrett Wilson would be a perfect fit at eight, but why should the Falcons pass up that kind of value when he checks so many boxes and teams are paying big money for pass catchers? Seems like he may not even be available at pick eight, and maybe it wouldn't be wise to pass on his value if he is. So, uh, Dan, I'm certainly in favor of the Falcons waiting to get their quarterback and CJ Stroud next year, uh, even though my negativity towards the current regime is that I don't have the confidence that they will be that patient and wait for their quarterback next year, but we'll see. Um, But in terms of, you know, particularly when you're comparing Garrett Wilson, Jamar chase and Steven, when you're talking about, you know, Garrett Wilson checks all these boxes and he can't pass up his value. I I, I don't get the Garrett Wilson hype. I I think he's a good player. And we talked about this on that mock draft Monday that came on the heels of the Sean Watson, Matt Ryan sort of fiasco. And it was sort of sandwiched in between the conversation with, Cordero Patterson's re-signing. So it kind of got buried in that episode. And I talked about Garrett Wilson in Atlanta and essentially sort of what I was saying is like, while I like Garrett Wilson as a prospect, I see him as a late first round sort of talent. Um, I see him as and Jahan Dotson is basically the same player, right? You know, I personally like Dotson a little bit more because I think Dotson's a little bit more polished as a route runner than Wilson is. Um, But like you look at where Dotson's being valued in this draft class, And he's being valued almost a full round later than Garrett Wilson is. You know, Wilson is being projected by most mock drafts and experts to be to go in the top eight, top 15 selections so that like in a world where he, quote unquote, fell to 16 to the Saints or something like that, people would be like, oh, man, that's the biggest steal of the draft. The Saints got him at 16. Right. And meanwhile, Dotson's being projected in like that 25 to 35 range to the point that he would only be labeled a steal if he were to fall to say like 43 for the Falcons or something like that, which is almost a full round after where Wilson is. And so I look at it like blue steel, La Tigra, they're the same thing, man. Like, I feel like I'm taking crazy pills when it comes to John Dotson and Garrett Wilson. Uh, you know, they're the same size, same rough speed, same type of archetype of player. And, you know, as I said on that previous mock draft Monday, like he's getting compared to Odell Beckham, Garrett Wilson, that is. And I know Daniel Jeremiah has Garrett Wilson in his top five, fifth, I think, in his top 50. And he made the comparison to Stefan Diggs in his blurb about Garrett Wilson. And I just disagree. I don't think he's that type of receiver. Right. I just don't think Wilson has the size that some of those guys that we're talking about has. And I know a lot of people hear them like, OK, what's, you know, Stefan Diggs, 195. Odell was like 198. Garrett Wilson's like 183. What's the big deal? And it's like, well, you look at some of the successful wide receivers in the NFL. Very few of them are very, as small as 183 as Garrett Wilson is. Right. And when you look at these undersized wide receivers that are being expected to go in the top 50, Garrett Wilson's 183. Jahan Dotson was 178 at his pro day and 181 at, or 178 at the combine and 181 at his pro day. Jamison Williams was 179 at the combine. And to me, when you look at these undersized receivers, if there's anybody that's going to emerge as a true number one wide receiver in the NFL, like to me, the best bet that you can make out of those three guys is probably Jamison Williams, right? 
to me, Jamison Williams and to a lesser extent, Drake London are the two guys that I would be willing to put the most money down uh, in terms of who's going to emerge from this draft class as wide receiver ones. Now, those are my top two wide receivers in this draft class. Jahan Dotson is my third ranked wide receiver, uh, but I, I kind of see him as a high end number two in the NFL. And that's why I think it's fair that he's being rated in the back into the first round and early second round that he can go to, you know, one of these playoff teams that probably already have a number one and he doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a true number one to sort of be a very effective player for them as a high end number two. And, you know, that's kind of the tier where I think Garrett Wilson and a lot of these other guys, now Garrett Wilson's like wide receiver six for me, but, you know, the gap between number three and number six, where I have Wilson, number seven, where I think Christian Watson is, I think Burks is five, and Olave's four for me. So they're all kind of jumbled up in that same sort of tier of player for me. Um, and, like, I, I just kind of see them as high-end number twos in the NFL. And we'll get into a little bit further on why I think that and why I don't necessarily see Garrett Wilson as a great bet uh, to be this high-end number one and thus can be – unlike what Steven said, someone that you can be willing to pass on that value at pick eight. And we'll get into that as we continue today's Locked On Falcons podcast. But guys, I want to remind you that Locked On Falcons is part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast family, where in addition to Locked On Falcons, Locked On Braves, Locked On Bulldogs, Locked On Hawks, etc., you can also find three new shows on the Locked On Sports Atlanta podcast feed. It's your all encompassing sports talk radio where they cover all of Atlanta and all of Georgia sports, not just one team like the rest of us do. You can get A to Z with Mark Zeno. You can get hit and hard with John Chuckery. And of course, ATL day ones with Jarvis Davis and Tanitra Batiste each and every day on their own podcast feed, whether you find it on Apple, Odyssey, Google, Spotify, or on YouTube. Again, search Locked On Sports Atlanta to find your preferred show on that podcast feed. And guys, I want to tell you about Built Bar, the protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar, even better than a candy bar because Built Bars not only taste good, they're good for you. They're low in sugar, low in calories, low in carbs, high in protein, high in fiber. We've been talking for several weeks now about their puff flavors, their first protein infused marshmallow. Uh, and you can get new flavors like mint marshmallow, coconut marshmallow, churro puff, banana cream pie. They even got some yellow cheeps or um, yellow chirps, I'm sorry, uh, for Easter holidays. And whether you're into the puffs or you're into, you know, waking up to a healthy version of a blueberry muffin, which Bill Bar has, maybe you want to indulge in that, you know, delicious, illustrious dessert like raspberry cheesecake, or maybe you just sort of want to go with, you know, if you're getting a candy bar, the combination of peanut butter and chocolate is an undefeated combination, and you can go find the peanut butter or the peanut butter brownie flavor by heading over to built.com. And when you go there, use the promo code LOCKS15 and you'll get 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. So, guys, I, I said about making bets, right? This is what the draft boils down to. The draft is essentially, you got to look at it as a crapshoot where you're essentially making bets. And those bets are basic. I bet player X is going to be, you know, NFL player X, and I'm willing to bet the 16th pick or the 84th pick or the 213th pick on that player becoming that thing. And so when I when I look at the receivers that have similar builds to Garrett Wilson, Jahan Dotson, and Jameson Williams in the NFL, and those guys that wind up being successful in the NFL, they primarily, for the most part, are number two wide receivers. There's a handful of number ones, uh, but most of those guys that are wind up being number ones fit more the Jamison Williams mold of player, which is a really explosive receiver. Because one of the things I went back is looked at all the wide receivers that have been drafted over the last 15 years looked at how many of them had 900 plus yard receive seasons, right? And, you know, I could have used a thousand yards, but I said, Hey, you know, why not have lowered to 900? Maybe you miss a couple of games and you don't break a thousand. So we can include guys like Devonte Smith and, and Calvin Ridley in that list and looked at how many guys, you know, had those 900 plus yard seasons in the first five years of their careers, right? Over the course of what would be the equivalent of a, of a rookie contract for a first round pick. And I looked at how many of those guys were sub 190 at the, at the combine or at their pro days. And of the 93 guys that had at least one 900 yard season over the last 15 years, right? 20 of them, roughly 22% of them were sub 190 pounds of the 47 guys that had multiple uh, of those 900 plus yard season, only seven of them uh, were under uh, uh, 190 pounds, about 15%. Although that includes, you know, a couple of guys that are pretty on the young side, 
Calvin Ridley, Hunter Renfro, Marquise Brown, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, Darnell Mooney, who, you know, have a couple of years before they hit that five year threshold. Uh, so they have a couple of opportunities to become one of those multi year guys. But ultimately, when I looked at the guys that were multiple 900 plus yard receivers that we would mostly label as number one wide receivers, because guys like Deontay Johnson have done it twice. Uh, no, most people would not say he's a number one. Tyler Lockett is borderline number one, but probably I think most people would say he's probably a number two. He's done it twice, but there's five guys that really stand out that were multi 900 plus yard receivers that I think most of us would agree were probably number ones. We're probably at their peaks, you know, top 10, top 15 wide receivers in the league. That was Brandon Cooks, T.Y. Hilton, Deshaun Jackson, Tyreek Hill, and Antonio Brown. And what's notable about those five players is four of those five players ran really fast 40s. Cooks was a 4-3-3 guy. Hilton was a 4-3-4. Jackson was 4-3-5. And, of course, Tyreek Hill was ran a 4-2-9. Brown's the only one of those guys that doesn't have four, sub-4-3-5 four, speed. He ran a 4-5-6 at his combine and 4-4-7 at his pro day. And we look at some of the sort of young guys, right? Again, I don't think Hunter Renfro or Darnell Moody would be considered a number one. I don't think Marquise Brown would be considered a number one, although he does have that sort of speed that we're talking about and that sort of low four threes, high four twos, although he didn't technically run a 40 uh, before the draft, as I recall. Calvin really doesn't have that type of speed. He's a four four guy. Uh, and again, he's not necessarily truly proven as a number one guy, although, you know, we collectively thought he had the potential to be that guy. I'm sure some people will sit here and say that he based off of the first five games this year, he did not live up to that potential. So you have Devontae Smith, who's, who's a 4-4 guy. Jalen Waddle, again, didn't run a 40. Uh, but, you know, most people, I think, probably think he would have ran in the high 4-2s, high 4-3s. So the point of me saying all that is there's it seems to be a repetitive type of player that when you're the smaller guy, the type of player that does wind up being a, a, a wide receiver one tends to be a guy that runs in the high 4-2s, low 4-3s. And that's not Garrett Wilson. Now, he ran a 4-3-8. That's not slow, right? Jahan Dotson's not that. He's a 4-4-3 guy. And they're more in that Devontae Smith, Calvin Ridley, Antonio Brown sort of build and mold and whatnot when we're talking about it. Or they're more like Tyler Lockett, who ran a 4-4. Hunter Renfro ran a 4-5. Deontay Johnson ran a 4-5. Darnell Moody, I think, ran a 4-3-6 or whatever the case. And, and these guys are more slot guys. And the point of me sitting here saying it is like the guys that are number ones typically are guys that have that elite speed. And I'm sure some of you are like, what's the difference between a 4-3-3 and a 4-3-8? 4-3-8 is plenty fast. Not really. Not in the NFL. It's plenty fast in college, guys. And again, I'm not trying to sit here and say 4 3 slow. It's not slow, but it's not like elite speed in the NFL because you got to think about what type of corners you're facing in the NFL. Right, the vast majority of corners starting outside corners in the NFL, and this is what we're really talking about with Garrett Wilson. Again, I think Garrett Wilson can be a high end slot receiver, but I question whether or not he can be a high end outside receiver. And the outside outside corners that you're going to face in the NFL, you know, are typically first and second round picks. Uh, almost two thirds of the starting outside corners in the NFL, if the season were to start tomorrow, and again, this number might increase once we get through the draft, are first or second round picks. And your average first round corner, guys is six foot, 196 pounds, and runs a 4.42. And a 4.38 is not beating that guy. And when that guy's 10 pounds heavier than Garrett Wilson, he's going to be able to lean on that guy, right? Patrick Sertan, A.J. Terrell, these guys are going to body Garrett Wilson when they line up on him on the outside. You know, Jair Alexander is going to be in his pocket. When he's running, Garrett Wilson's running his route, and he turns around, and, and he hears a voice go, where are you going? And then he's going to look around, and it's going to be Jair Alexander right in his hip pocket. And I know some of you guys are going to be like, hey, man, Aaron, these are some of the best corners in the NFL. And the point, that's the point, guys. If you're going to be a true number one wide receiver in the NFL, these are the caliber of corners you have to beat. And I question whether a guy like Garrett Wilson is going to be able to beat those guys. Just like I think most people would question Jahan Dotson being able to beat those guys. But people aren't, to me, overvaluing Jahan Dotson. They're valuing him in the right spot, late first, early second round. And that, to me, is where Garrett Wilson should be valued as well. And so the point is that when you see the guys that are the exception to this, they have those 434, 432, 429 speed that is going to be able to run past the Patrick Sertans and the AJ Terrells and the Jair Alexanders. That is what we're talking about. Elite speed, the Brandon Cooks, the T.Y. Hiltons, the Deshaun Jacksons, the Tyreek Hills, potentially the Jalen Waddles of the world. If you're going to bet on an undersized receiver, bet on someone that runs in the low four threes. And I don't think that's Garrett Wilson. So it's not to sit here and say Garrett Wilson's going to be a bust in the NFL. I just think if you're drafting him at, at 
pick eight, you're probably going to be a little bit disappointed because I think ultimately when you're looking at his range of outcomes, yeah, you got the Antonio Browns, but Antonio Brown is like the outlier of all the outliers. And you have Devontae Smith, who technically would probably be considered another outlier type of player. But I think Devontae Smith is a much better prospect than Garrett Wilson. And even then, I didn't think Devontae Smith was worthy of really a top 10 pick last year. He wound up being the 10th overall selection because the Eagles traded up to get him at 10 from 12 to 10. But like in terms of betting on Devontae Smith over Jalen Waddle or Jamar Chase, I wouldn't have made that bet. But again, I thought Devontae Smith certainly had the potential to, you know, be one of these outlier type of players because we watched him cook Derek Stingley multiple times. And goes back to what we said about AJ Terrell and my scouting report back then when I talked about him in that national championship week in Alabama. It wasn't Henry Ruggs or Jerry Judy that gave AJ Terrell the most problems that game. It was Devontae Smith. So he was a guy that, again, in the middle of the first round, would be more than willing to bet on as a potential number one despite the fact that he's you know this tall skinny guy and whatever and i made all the jokes in the world that he was 138 pounds last all see all those various things and i think Devonte smith is much better prospect than garrett wilson and so like that's that's my issue with garrett wilson i just i just don't get why he's so highly touted among so many people i just i think he's going to be a slot receiver in the nfl and probably a high end number two it's probably his likely outcome and, and potentially a low end number one. But you look at the Tyler Lockett's, you look at the Emmanuel Sanders. Those are the types of receivers that are built his way and with his type of speed. And those are the types of guys that tend to be the high end guys. Or you have, you know, the Hunter Renfro's. I think he's better than Hunter Renfro. But, you know, like these pure slot receivers that are m- primarily number threes, Deontay Johnson, another example. That's probably Garrett Wilson's floor. Uh, but to me, his ceiling, you know, again, I don't think he's going to be Antonio Brown. And I think if you're taking them at eight, you're betting on him being Antonio Brown. I don't think that's a good bet. Right. And it's, you know, ultimately it boils down to when we talk about these premium positions, it's, you know, you can use the eight versus 82. Uh, it's a, some, some theory that I've come up with, right. Because the Falcons have the eighth and the 82nd overall pick. So it applies specifically to the Falcons. I mean, you look at some of these premium positions, wide receiver is not the same as, as some of these other premium positions. You look at quarterback, right? We know the drop off from the talent that you can find at pick eight, in a typical draft to 82 at quarterback. Like that's self-explanatory. Don't need to break that down. Offensive tackle is interesting because most of the starting offensive tackles in the NFL, like most of the starting outside corners in the NFL are first and second round picks. So if you're taking an offensive tackle at 82, you're expecting to get like a book in left tackle for the next decade, like a Jake Matthews. But if you wait till 82 to take an offensive tackle, more than likely you're getting a career backup. You know, there's a couple of Teron Armsteads and Orlando Brown juniors or whatever that, you know, go on to be success. But most of the third round tackles are swing tackles and career backups cornerbacks a similar situation at least when it comes to outside corners right it's basically the drop off from patrick sertan and the typical third round corner is someone like fabian moreau which is like that's probably not going to be a fixture in terms of your long-term outside corner now nickel corners slot corners you can find good value at, at in the third round at pick 82 in in the slot because NFL teams don't value slot corners like that. So if you're looking for a nickel guy, then yeah, you can wait to 82 to get that position. Um, you know, then you go to edge rusher. That's the fourth premium position. And edge rusher is not quite to the same degree as these other three positions, where because we have just enough guys that like are then Yannick Ngakwe, Trey Hendrickson, Max Crosby that are taken in, in the third, fourth round that turn out to be really good pass rushers in the NFL. And so you sit there and you go, like that drop off from eight to 82 at edge rusher is quite not the same. And then wide receiver, we know that if you look at recent drafts, frankly, you know, some data that you probably look up will tell you that you're better served drafting. Drafting, waiting to 82 to take, take a wide receiver and the outcomes are better there than they are picking that guy at eight. And the, I think, you know, the Jamar Chase and the Jalen Waddles are going to change that narrative back and shift it back to where eight is still more valuable than 82. But that drop off, uh, certainly among the premium positions, is minimal to the point. Again, it's not quite to the same degree that uh, running back is, but wide receiver, relatively speaking to some of these other premium positions, is much more of a dime a dozen uh, sort of position kind of like running back is kind of like tight end, kind of like other offensive skill positions are where the value in is going to be there in rounds two, three, four, and later in the draft. Now I have an interesting hypothesis on why that is. Um, 
and you guys can take it and run with it. And again, you know, I'm not going to write any sort of, you know, papers or anything like that and, and submit this to journals or anything like that. But just a running theory that I have is that, you know, these other premium positions like quarterback, offensive tackle and cornerback are kind of you could describe them as point of failure positions. Right. Like if you mess up as a cornerback or a quarterback, you're throwing an interception. That's a bad thing. You mess up as a tackle. You're giving up a sack. That's a bad thing. You mess up as a corner. You're giving up a touchdown. That's a bad thing. And so there, it's a this premium on these positions that you need to have really good players, not to mention, you know, these guys, generally speaking, are playing 100 percent of your snaps on offense and defense. Edge rusher and, and wide receiver are not really point of failure positions. They're more like collective point of success. I don't know what you would what the opposite would be described as. But like, you know, when you have a four man pass rush, right, you just need one guy to win his matchup to have an effective pass rush. You don't need all, you know, so. Uh, wide receiver is the same thing. You have three to five guys on any given play running routes. And so you just need one guy to get open to have a successful pass play. And so I think the the argument, the hype, the hypothesis I'm having, the theory I'm putting forth is like some of these positions, these premium positions where it's about the collective, right? It's not about having one sort of elite guy. Now, if you have a Julio Jones or whatever the case may be, if you have a Jalen Ramsey or not a Jalen Ramsey, if you have, uh, you know, a Miles Garrett, um, at these positions, no one's going to sit here and say, that's a bad thing. Of course, have a dominant player. Um, but I don't think it's as important to have a dominant player at those positions. And I think that's certainly been reflected in recent drafts at the wide receiver position. We can have a conversation, you know, uh, whether or not that should be also reflected at edge rusher, that it's not about trying to find the next, you know, 20, 15 sack guy. Although again, that guy's valuable. You know, if you can just get like three or four, eight sack guys, um, you know, that is just as valuable or whatever. So you should be trying to, to mine the talent for that. So that's just the theory I have. You guys can take that, you know, you can put that in your pipe and smoke it or whatever you want to do, but it just sort of leads to my general belief of like, you know, you can wait on wide receiver, like, unless you believe that, you know, you're drafting the next Julio Jones, you're drafting a Jamar chase who is in that sort of tier of player. Like, I just don't feel like it makes a ton of sense to, to use that high of premium pick on a wide receiver. Like, again, I, I like Jamison Williams. He'd be one of the guys that I bet, but I probably wouldn't take him at eight, particularly now that he's injured, right? I'd probably take him in, in teens and in, in, in around the 12 to 15 range. Same thing with Drake London. Like, again, I think he's probably one of the better bets to be a, a number one wide receiver because, again, you know, when you look back at the, as I explained, the history of all these wide receivers, the vast majority of these guys are big guys, right? I, the reason why these 200 plus pound receivers dominate the list of number one wide receivers because you need to have size to go up against the corners that you're facing. You need to be bigger, stronger, faster than these guys. And so you better be 220 plus pounds. When you look at the the, the receivers that AJ Terrell struggled with, it's like Mike Evans, who's like 230. It's uh, Michael Thomas, who's like 215. It's like guys that are 20 plus, 30 plus pounds bigger than, you know, go back to Desmond Trufant. Mike Evans was on that list, right? AJ Brown, 230 uh, wide receiver. Like you need to have this bulk on you uh and that's why the typical you know ex great wide receivers are either small guys that are extremely fast or really big guys right or you know the sort of the mid-tier guys the, the the digs and the beckhams and whatnot that are the perfect balance of the two but often are guys that are solely reliant on them becoming elite route runners and whatnot so um that's kind of my theory on it and so i just kind of look at it and i just say like why not just wait and bet on some guys at 82 again not going to sit here and say you know calvin austin or danny gray or tyquan thornton are going to be better players than um you know garrett wilson uh but i just sit here and i go like is it worth me to bet on that guy at eight rather than to just you know take a swing at one of these you know guys that probably again probably not a great bet that he's going to turn into a number one wide receiver but again going back to the theory of like i just need a guy that can get open some of the time i don't need a guy that can get open all of the time and i can get those guys at 82 and i'll bet on a calvin austin who's 170 pounds and runs a 432 or Danny gray who's 180 something pounds and runs a 432 or tyquan thornton is 180 pounds and runs a 428 again going back to these guys again not saying that those guys are going to be the next you know um, Deshaun Jackson or anything like that. But I'm just sitting there saying, like, I think that's a worthwhile bet for you relative to what you do and, and use that eighth overall pick on, on another position, like a, you know, an edge rusher or like a corner or like a quarterback or whatever the case may be, where it's kind of a little bit more meaningful to get that max value at that position. So that's kind of how I feel about, you know, Garrett Wilson. I'll stop rambling at this point in time. I'm, I'm sure I would have a lot more to say about this, but we'll leave it there. 
uh, and you can, you know, refresh your palate uh, with these anti Garrett Wilson agenda that I'm expressing here on the podcast, because I'm sure you can go to locked on NFL draft podcast and find Eric Crocker and Ryan Tracy, much more praising of Garrett Wilson. I'm sure you can find locked on Bulldogs. Uh, I'm not sorry, locked on Buckeyes, uh, much more praising of Garrett Wilson. And so if you're looking for a second listen after you made locked on Falcons, your first listen to, you know, show and put Aaron Freeman in his place and, and prove that he is no guru uh, and has no clue what he's talking about. Go check out those shows on your preferred podcast platform, guys. That's going to do it for us here uh, on today. We will have somebody on tomorrow's episode, uh, Adam Holloway. Uh, you know him as Damsky32 on Twitter. Uh, he's been a previous guest on the podcast, and he's pro Garrett Wilson. So he'll, uh, you know, come on and, and defend Garrett Wilson's probably honor on tomorrow's episode. And we'll sort of pick his brain on some of the guys that he's intrigued by. And then later in the week, we'll be re rejoined by Mark Schofield. And we'll take a deeper look at the quarterbacks at the top of this draft, like Malik Willis and Desmond Ritter and possibly Kenny Pickett as well. So you can stay tuned for that here on Locked on Falcons. If you want to tell me why I'm an idiot for hating on Garrett Wilson, of course, you can provide your feedback via Twitter at Locked on Falcons, via Facebook at Locked on Falcons. You can send an email to Locked on Falcons at mail.com, or you can leave a comment here on the Locked on Falcons YouTube channel. Guys, I appreciate you tuning in and listening to my anti Garrett Wilson rant. Uh, you know, the, the moral of the story is that I think Garrett Wilson's trash and he's going to be an absolute bust. Again, that's not really what I said, but I know that's going to be the takeaway. So I'm, I'm willing to let you guys run with it on that. So that will do it for us here, guys, on today's Lockdown Falcons. Appreciate it. Till then.